Well, yes, well, I'm Elo Tarasti. Uh, well, I think I'm the coordinator, however, because we are dealing with this existential semiotics. But uh, let me see if my, my students are all here, namely Daniel. Daniel, I see you. Yes, you are there. And the, I see, wait a minute, I see Panu. Yes, and Sayantan from Kolkata. And I see, wait a minute, there are still missing some, but, but they, they will join, I suppose. In the order. All right, but let us say, I promise to say a few, few words as an introduction to what then uh, my students will tell about the application of this new theory uh, in the field of semiotics. So you may have heard of the, this title, Existential Semiotics, already somewhere. <laughs> I have been publishing since over 20 years um, uh, studies on it, and um, it is supposed to be something, some kind of new paradigm within semiotics. Which is, uh, which is um, combining, in fact, um, uh, I would say the, the continental philosophy, starting with Kant, Hegel, especially Hegel, and then continuing to uh, Heidegger, Jaspers, and, and uh, Kierkegaard, and, and other, uh, and the classical semiotic tradition, by, whereby I understand, of course, in the first place, uh, the Paris School of I.G. Gremas. Uh, who was my, my ma major school first in semiotics. So many elements uh, remain the same from Grimasia and semiotics, so I have not abandoned it. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm faithful in, in some sense. Uh, but uh, however, this is a new configuration of knowledge, um, as Monsieur Foucault would have said, uh, I suppose. And um, uh, you may have seen, I just showed you <laughs> this yellow book, which was my first one, uh, published by Indiana. University Press in the time of Thomas Sibiok, and then uh, for later sources, the most recent is by Mouton de Greater, which is my my uh, pub publisher right now in Berlin. Zainot Schein. Title is in German, but text is in English, as, as you know, and so it's like that. And then, of course, uh, this theory exists in many other languages, like in Italian. I have this uh, Fundamenti di Semiotica Esistenziale. You may see it's one, and then of course in French a lot. Uh, this is by Larmatan, uh, Fond de la Semiotique Existentielle. And then I have three books in Chinese already. Uh, in, in with Chinese, I uh, have in Bulgarian, Albanian, Finnish. So, so it is available in many languages. Now, what it is um, altogether, I, I very shortly tell you. Um, uh, many elements stem from Hegel, his Wissenschaft der Logik, the science of logic, like the, the um, categories of being and its, its varieties, uh, um, ansich sein, für sich sein, etc., being in oneself, being for, uh, which I um, used and put in a kind of a semiotic square, which, which was heritage from, from Gray Massia semiotics. So that we had our four cases, namely uh, being um, uh, for myself, be, being in myself, being for myself, being in oneself, and being for oneself, if I put in English uh, all this. But then this was dynamized. And then it stopped to be any longer a semitic square. It became a, what I call Zemic model. Zemic is a new title here, and it is stemming from Z which portrays the movement between these, among these four cases and, and the, the movement within the model. And emic, stemming from the American linguist Kenneth Pike, emic meaning uh, seeing from uh, inner, from interior, for intuitively, from qualitatively, everything. So um, uh, there are many movements, and that is um, perhaps new in semiotics, that um, it is not static model, it's not uh, the category, the, the Cartesian uh, strict uh, model um, with fixed categories, but it is always in movement. And um, this movement from, uh, from set can be seen from movement from the, like Le Cordelevi-Strauss put it from le sensible, from the concrete, physical, to l'intelligible, to the in, in, intelligible, to the abstract. Uh, so, and um, this tension between them or if you if you uh, like to be a German uh, philosopher like Theodor Adorno, you might see it might be uh, me and society. Note 
I intrude here these categories, moi and soi. Well, Jacques Fondani has used the, these, uh, among others, but of course they are uh, common in French philosophy, for Ricoeur, etc. So moi and soi. And so my model altogether is a model of the human mind, how it functions. And then uh, there is still more movement, namely our subject can leave this semic uh, world, it can transcend it. And so I launched the doctrine of transcendence, which uh, certainly does not appear at all in any dictionary or encyclopedia of semiotics, but it is very important in my theories, transcendence. And I distinguish two kinds of transcendencies following the French Jean Var, namely transascendance and transdescendance. Transascendance means that um, we are elevated towards transcendental <laughs> realms, uh, reaching first what I call supratsemic level, which is the same as Hegelian Wesen, the essence, where we reflect what happens in our mundane world. But it continues to the real transcendence. So that is, we are aspiring for something uh, clearer, better, uh, logical, more logical, coherent than our everyday world. But that is the sense in which Jean Paul Sartre, among others, uh, used the, the, the um, transcendence. But you might make another epistemological choose, namely speak of transdescendance, thinking that the, the ultimate real is the transcendence there somewhere, which is then emanating, uh, appearing by an annunciation. And that is almost something like theological. My system is not theological, but some people have interpreted it in that sense. But uh, there is that, um, you know, want. So I don't want to continue any, any longer. I did take the time for my, my student, but um, um, I have applied myself, of course, this uh, to my own empirical fields, which are in the first place music. I've uh, written many music analyses of Mozart, Schumann, Wagner, Sibelius, Edward Villalobos, <laughs> many composers, and also about performing arts, uh, culture, visual arts, etc. But um, I would say that uh, this existential semiotics should have relevance for the humanities in general as a kind of uh, model which might direct our research. So thank you very much. This was my introduction. And now I propose we could continue with uh, Daniel. So, Daniel. Thank you, Aero. Uh, good morning. The attendance to the second senior conference. Uh, if you don't mind, I will. Oh, I can't share. I can't share my slide presentation. I, it says um, uh, I should have. I should send it to the to the organizing committee. What should I do? Uh, you can present by yourself. Okay. Okay. So um, I suppose I should talk a little bit about me right now. Uh, I concluded my PhD last year at the University of Brasilia. Now two uh, papers have already been published by Routledge at the International Forum of Psychoanalysis. Uh, my work, uh, in my work, I focus on uh, psychoanalysis and opera uh, with a musicological approach to psychoanalysis and the psychoanalytic approach to musicology. I have been also been attending uh, semiotic conferences since 2014. And uh, today I will talk about uh, my approach, my semiotic approach to clinical practice, uh, where I uh, discuss uh, the use, the application of existential semiotics and the uh, the use of modal verbs in clinical diagnostics. And uh, well, uh, I have been doing this now. Next year uh, should be my 10th year of uh, clinical practice in Brazilian. 
and very well uh, in my paper which i sent to the to the present conference i wrote about this uh, historical or maybe mythical meeting between uh, hippocrates the physician from kos uh, 5th century bc he was asked by the citizens and the senate the senate of abdera uh, he was asked to join them because uh, there was a, a famous citizen from abdera uh, whom they thought uh, was suffering from mental illness uh, you might have you might have heard of this uh, famous citizen his name was uh, democritus and uh, Democritus, uh, the one that invented the, the atom, the idea of the atom. So uh, the issue is that uh, Democritus was alone uh, studying uh, the, the source, the cause uh, of melancholy. So uh, he was uh, isolated and studying alone. And uh, he was also laughing. He was laughing all the time and uh, people didn't know why. So Hippocrates went there and uh, discovered that uh, he was actually very fine. Uh, the reason why he was laughing was because, uh, because the citizens of Abdera, they were uh, not well in mind in his own uh, perspective. They, uh, work it too much, they well delved in uh, excesses, drank too much wine, and uh, there's a whole description of the mental problems, the personal problems they had in Democritus' uh, replies to, to Hippocrates. There's a series of letters, the whole story is comprised of uh, around 14 letters, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, Hippocrates uh, is considered by uh, many semioticians like Marcel Danesi, Thomas Sibioc. Uh, there is also uh, this statement by Rudolf Kleinpo, uh, which Danesi quotes, uh, that uh, Hippocrates was the first uh, semiotician. So it seems that uh, if this is true, of course, then semiotics is born uh, in clinical practice. So. Uh, and since then, uh, it has been an important part of clinical practice, of clinical theory and practice. So, but then, uh, okay, I, I just received this message. Of course, uh, I must uh, continue now. This, this is very short, I presented only, I prepared only 10 slides, so, you have now this uh, meeting between Hippocrates and Democritus, and then uh, I'll just skip, uh, skip like uh, 2000 years of clinical practice. Medicine has been around uh, since then. And then um, of course, uh, Hippocrates continues to be an uh, uh, important uh, relevant author for uh, physicians and uh, clinical practitioners until, for instance, in the Romanticism. The Romanticism, uh, the clinical practice turned uh, the attention more to what we call uh, affects. So this notion of affects is quite different from the one in uh, Baroque music, uh, which is uh, too intellectualist. Uh, and now we talk about, when we talk about affects, and for instance, the passions, uh, we talk about uh, inner uh, personal experiences and not only uh, clinical um, uh, concepts like uh, paranoia, schizophrenia, depression. Then uh, in clinical practice, uh, 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 and we, we want to learn about uh, the patient's passions. So the, when we study the patient passions, the, the, patient, the patient's passions, uh, we focus on this analysis of modal verbs, uh, for instance, what a patient wants, what a patient uh, knows, what a patient can do, can't do, what the patient thinks they should do, 
what they must do. Then uh, this is <coughs> this uh, idea of using uh, modal verbs in clinical practice was originally introduced by uh, Victor von Weizsäcker, the German physician in Heidelberg. He worked closely uh, uh, to Karl Jaspers and uh, Thure von Uxkul at the University Hospital there in uh, University of Heidelberg. Um, and then uh, also uh, the, the use of modal verbs uh, has in clinical practice have been influenced by uh, by Greimas, of course, uh, my supervisor, uh, my PhD supervisor here in Brasilia uh, was heavily influenced by uh, Greimas himself. He, he published this book, uh, book where he studies, uh, where he uh, writes clinical diagnosis uh, within the semiotic square from Greimas. And then of course, there is this uh, inventory of modal verbs and uh, Yes, so uh, th then there's this influence from gray masks, which also influenced uh, Tarashi's existential semiotics and his Zemic model, the inventory uh, Tarashi, the inventory of model verbs Tarashi uses comes, uh, comes, oh, I'm being asked if Sayatan should start now. I believe I have like 10 minutes. So I have, I should have like more five minutes at least. Is that okay? I'm receiving a message here. No. What? No, Bianca, please. I think you have only three minutes because we still have four other speeches for one hour. So please try to be short. Okay, so just uh, to conclude, uh, this this paper which I sent uh, is about this uh, novel, this short play by Marshall Jassis, uh, where uh, he comments about this uh, physician, Simon Bacamarte, who identified himself, he felt like Hippocrates and Democritus, and then uh, he sent everyone to the mental asylum, and at the end, he sent himself there for, uh, in order to, to find the true, the true cause of mental illness, he should find it uh, in, in himself first. So uh, now I, I have concluded. Um, it's 11.19 uh, and uh, I pass my word to Sayatan. Thank you all. Well, I think we read about uh, the science and you're already there. Okay, well, Alexi is also there, but uh, oh, please, science and you may co but continue. Welcome. Oh. Thank you. So I am Shayantan Dashgupta. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Helsinki in Finland, originally from Kolkata in the western part of Bengal. Today, I shall be talking about the question of ideology and alienation in existential semiotics. So uh, in the so-called existentialism debate after the Second World War between Jean-Paul Sartre and the French communists, uh, the main argument was about Sartre's claim that existence precedes essence, that uh, according to that, even if the subject has already rejected the bourgeois content, but the bourgeois form is still there. So it's not a complete movement. It's not a successful movement. Uh, so in existential semiotics, when the when a subject leaps into nothingness and uh, rejected the previous Dasein, uh, the according to Professor Tarasi, the subject could come back to that Dasein. Maybe the Dasein had changed. Maybe everything has changed, but he or she could come back to that. For me, this could only happen because of the presence of that con uh, that form, even as the subject has already rejected the uh, content, but the, as the form is still there, which is constantly being affected by ideology, that's why the subject could come back to that. It is also what Frederick Jameson called the second nature, which is, uh, which is placed between nature and human freedom and affect social norms and values and also uh, social practices. Uh, so even when the subject had rejected the previous design, uh, 
why would she come back the reason is that uh, what clever zizek called belief before belief or to use althusser's example of ideological state apparatus that the presence of isa itself generates belief even before it started to act therefore even when the subject believes that she is coming back to something else or maybe something has changed even after deciding to reject that that subject is actually coming back because of the generation of that belief previously she herself rejected uh, therefore when she creates a sign that becomes according to me an inauthentic sign or that sign is completely influenced by ideology or the form that is still there or to use uh, theodore adorno's philosophy that a work of art the content of a of an of a work of art stands judged by its form because the form is the source of comprehension so what happened uh, what should we do when a subject even after rejection comes back to the same place and creates an inauthentic sign Prof according to professor toraste when the uh, subject leaps into nothingness uh, she feels kind of an alienation or estrangement uh, according to karl marx the remedy to this alienation is the actualization of possibilities in being and to reach others through those possibilities which is also in synchrony with what professor tarasti called the subject's contact with uh, plenitude or uh, in a supra individual way so keeping that in mind um, we can say that the zemic formation of a subject is more like what hegel called in his logic an essence because the phrase before that creation of the zemic uh, which is very vital in existential semiotics is what is immediate or in hegelian term we can call it a being so if we choose to keep in account not just what we actualized but what we rejected to again use hegelian logic while we were skimming through the random passing flowing images what we find is what i call in existential semiotic the plane of dasein or in hegelian term we can actually call it in and for itself or the hegelian notion uh, what happened then is that uh, that plane of dasein is what according to what if i may use a term from lacan that is real for the individual why that is real because there i'm not just actualizing what uh, my second nature or my idealized nature is telling me to but i'm also actualizing what my ideology ideologized or the bourgeois form is telling me to actualize so i am going beyond that ideology therefore that is what i call the real for the individual and uh, as i said according to professor tarasti the transcendence is the is a place of plenitude uh, where i uh, which according to me is the transcendental real so now when the subject after leaping into nothingness and uh, rejecting the previous design when trying to create another sign what she does is uh, he brings into contact the in, the real that is individual and the real that is transcendental so there is no second nature no ideal ideologized uh, form there is nothing so what happened is that the subject could create something in the affirmation of the second dasein or when she comes back is what i call authentic sign what is authentic sign it is not something divine or something uh, infallible or which can never go wrong absolutely um, authentic signs could go wrong because uh, this is what i call either existentially collective or collectively existential but it is uh, it is beyond the realm of ideology uh, which means uh, this sign whatever happens is the responsibility of the subject of the result so uh, it is as i said it is extremely existential in that sense so uh, my uh, plan next is to develop this theory and use it in different fields like what is co uh, connected to my phd like james joyce and also uh, like psychoanalysis and also richard wagner and uh, apart from that uh, my another uh, very important um, development that i'm trying to do is to use the same sartian logic uh, to connect what i call the being and the other and the transcendence as a very human form 
so that people do not misunderstand it as something divine or something that is beyond uh, human uh, possibility or ability. Thank you. Many thanks, Sajatam. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So, so you have two approaches, this <coughs> philosophical, philosophical one, and then this quite concrete uh, literary studies in James Joyce and his Dubliners, which you are going to, to study in your doctorate thesis for University of Helsinki. So thank you very much. Great. And I think we should continue because <laughs> time is running. And um, Alexi, you are there, yes, fine. Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, we are ready. Yes, good day. So I'm Alexi Haukka, a doctoral student in University of Helsinki on musicology or musicology or um, mu semiotics of music. I started my doctoral thesis in 2017. Its uh, topic is uh, patriotic uh, songs from uh, 19th century. There are three uh, materials, so three different uh, historical situations. Well, first is before 19th century from French Revolution, then from the uh, Spanish War of Independence against Napoleon, and then from 1850s and 1860s uh, Finland. So I'm applying uh, Professor Tarastis uh, existential semiotic uh, model to music and uh, specifically to analysis of songs. So I try, have tried to develop uh, this method for song analysis from a semitic point of view, from existential semitic point of view. So, of course, when we are dealing with uh, songs, we have uh, two different semiotical systems. We have the linguistic code and, and the musical code. Uh, so the music, the tones and the words, basically, and how, how these interact together. It's of course easy to analyze, but it's not that easy to then bring these results of the analysis together. And that's what I try to do with this method that I have tried to develop. So I will now next try very briefly and give a basic account of this method. Uh, it's based on uh, Tarasti, uh, Tarasti's uh, 2012 uh, Semitics of Classical Music on the Existential Semitic uh, Method for Music Analysis presented there and partly on Kofi Akavu's uh, <coughs> Method for Analysis of Lead. So there are four um, steps that we proceed with. Uh, first, we of course have the subject of the song. So the basic idea that is expressed in the in the lyrics of the song and we first, so we start with that using and applying the existing uh, semitic the zemic model uh, intended to to give account of these dif of those different uh, levels or modes of design and their functioning so that's the first step, the, the poem in itself. And in the next step, uh, first, it actually has four different steps. The first step in the second step is uh, the points of attraction, attraction and musical points of attraction in the song. And after that, just the basic musical analysis using the normal theoretical tools, but also this uh, Zemic model. And then in the third step of the second step, we try to see the relations between these verbal and musical expressions. And in the fourth step of this second step, or actually maybe it should be called a stage because it's a larger. Uh, the fourth step is the first interpretation of the song but that's of course not sufficient in itself. Uh, we then have the third stage where we try to look at the circumstances of the song, uh, at the context of the song, the musical context, but also in my case, of course, the political context, the artistic context, literary context, and, and so on. Perhaps also what is happening in the life of the composer. And then in the second 
uh, step of this stage, we try to unify these results from the th second and third stage. And in the fourth stage is basically just the narrativization of this uh, analysis, uh, depending, of course, on the on the forum where the analysis or commentary is presented. So how do we analyze the lyric, for example? So we have these four levels, the Mua and Sua, and there are four different uh, cases. I will now use the M just uh, in, instead of Mua. So we have the M1 or the Mua1, the M2, the S2, and S1. So basically the body, M1, M2, the, the individuality or the personality. So it's the M2, the S2, the social practices of which the, of, of the Dasein, which are going on, mm. and then the S1, the, the conceptual uh, ideas, the abstract ideas. The most abstract in the poem, and uh, for example, in in case of poem, you have of course the rhythm and the meter, the the that's related of course to the rhythm, but also these basic um, themic categories: is it euphoric? Is it dysphoric? Uh, and what perhaps also what are just the corporal. Uh, qualities of the words, uh, how, how do they sound, what are, what tones do they have in, the, in this sense, in this quite abstract sense. In M2, this is the level of the persons, of the individuality, so we of course have the objects, events, actors, actors in the in Kramerian sense, um, which, which give account of this differentiation of the any poem. And of course, these actors can be of different categories. Also, like we have an uh, actor that belongs to category of M1 within a poem like light or shadow or darkness or something like that. Uh, M2, for example, Napoleon or Wellington, something like that. S2, uh, like Republic, monarchy that's active, uh, active political entity and and. S1, of course, is, is something that you will be encounter often, like liberty, for example, or victory, or something like that. Um, then in S2, there's of course the style of the poem, the genre, how it's related to the, what what are similar poem poems to it, to which class does it belong, like tragedy or or uh, decasyllabic meter i mean the like the, the issue with meter and rhythm is of course uh, interesting because it's something that's m1 but also s2 when it's established and then finally we have the s1 of the uh, intelligible ideas that are signified in the, in the verses like like in my case it's of, often patriotism in, in my materials or it can be, of course, love in, in typical lyrical fashion. And then you have the musical analysis, which it's actually almost the same that is presented in, in Tarasti's Semitics of Classical Music. So in M1, you have those basic corporeal qualities of music, the energy, the kinetic energy of the music, the rhythm, the meter, the dynamic changes, and so on, the tempo. In M2, musical actors so go to like the themes, most obviously, S2 genres, as in the case of poem, and also the structures like sonata and fugue, and so on. And then finally, S1, the intellectual ideas, ideas signified in the music, like uh, heroism, for example. So this is. <laughs> very abbreviated form, of course, of, of this method that I have been developing for my PhD. And I think I'm out of time and I have said what I have wanted to say today. Thanks.
Thank you. Thanks, Alex, very much. It's, your view is very exciting. And I remember how it developed uh, from this Spanish context, for, because you first studied Fernando Zor, this famous uh, Spanish uh, uh, composer and guitar player, but then you expanded from, from Spain to, to France to revolutionary revolution time songs, and which, by the way, have been studied uh, by the Russian Boris Asafiev in his musical form as a process. And, and then you come to Finland to the 19th century. So you have three different European societies uh, in the face of forming their nation, national uh, identities or, or patriotism. So um, do you see that this, this uh, historical sociological situation might be also one unifying factor in your thesis? Yes, indeed. Yes, OK. And then, of course, you have the method methodology. So you use the same same methodological issues for each case. So it, it makes it quite logical. Well, yes. thank you very much. Okay, then I think we might continue. Maybe Sari, you are there. Sari Helkala, yes, welcome. All right, and we have now an other type of approach from them. Again, from yeah. uh, Is there time for Panu? Panu, uh, Panu, or Sari? Uh, yeah. Oh, whoever. No, maybe Sari Helga. If you Sari now. Yes. Sari, you are on mute. Open the microphone. Yes. Everything okay. Yes. Hey, my name is Sari Helkala Koivisto and I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Helsinki. I'm currently working as an independent researcher in music semiotics. My dissertation in musicology, music and autism, a prosodic sign in existential semiotics was completed in 2015. The dialogic key to linguistic communication was the musically and linguistically manifested prosody. The research focused on the character relationship between musical signs and children's autistic expression. The current part of my postdoctoral work relates to the internal bodily processes of music and art. These processes are creating first experiential touch of time and space towards man's cognitive thinking. As we know, the first uh, frame movements that create a form of cognitive thinking are the advancing time and the changing state already existing for us in prenatal developmental styles and periods. A deep sense uh, of that deep sensation and changes in muscle tension, muscle movement memory are called pre-conscious modulations of energy in human life. The mentioned inner images of the body-mind seem to guide learning and our adaptation to the world and other people's communication around. It can be assumed in addition to music, possibly there are also within other artistic forms of expression, the accentuating signs of early prenatal creative and deep motivation derived from the first neural automations on neural connections being associated with early developmental motion. So the project will be still based on the previously known theories of music, art and autism rehabilitation. They were developed by Italian music and art semioticians, Sino Stefani and Stefania Querralisi. The theories prenatal styles in music, globality of languages in subjective human development, and uh, semiosynesthesia inside the prenatal early automatic nervous system. The study goes on as well using Professor Taras' this existential semiotic set model and its new progressive theoretical openings. And as well, the theory of mind inverted S model the interpretation of prosodic science in between musical semiotics and autism. It's one evolving signification in my present scrutiny. At the heart of my postdoctoral work, the semiotics interest is still signified existential science. 
the music as a cultural heritage, including the developmental science of human being and autistic children's interaction skills. Musical and arts communication are related to the research subjects, linguistic expressions in between so-called normal non-autistic people compared to special or so-called non-normal ones with autism. The aim of my work is to elucidate the changing internal state of musical communication that precedes and manifests itself as ordinary dialogic interaction between humans before speech and during their interactive speech. It's still a question of the signification in prosodic expression of science preceding and attached to the spoken language between two expressive subjects, those who are communicating in different ways, language, while coming into contact with different cultures. The current research continues to focus on the life and signification of prosodic science in the music and now also in interactive communicative speech. The interpretation and communicating cultural presence are still the non-verbal signs between linguistic and musical interaction. The interpretation and communicative understanding of prosodic signs must be recognized somehow exactly in a certain way. The research assumes that if the communicative human interpretations understand, or they can read or translate each other, they occur semiotically in the same key port in musical, musical and linguistic interaction. To understand concepts and human behavior moved by language, we need to take experientialism into account, to have the state of experientiality as the object of consideration. Awakening, awakening a sense of experientialism is an existential function of prosody. In theatrical prosody, we can recognize the deep representational power of signification inside the, the prosody of language around us, the signified sign express function is deeply cultural. The third touch of experience is signified by the prosody of the mind, wherein the expressive state is revealing the emotional state of the speaker. The prosody of expression will now be signified deeply subjective by others in the minds of those who receive the mentioned expression. It's typical for us to understand always more than what has been said. People have a cultural ability to read not only what is said, but also what is between the lines. Between the linguistic spoken lines can be found the living prosody of mind. The body mind is a state of the developing personal self the primary subject on encountering the world. As we know in Tarasti's Z model, the first existential modality is called Mova, that is subject's first signified being in the world through being in myself. It doesn't mean yet a linguistic interactive life world in social discourse, but communicates to each of us being found in different forms of experiencing art and musical signification. It's not in the same form of spoken language, but as the signified and received information, it manifests itself to each of us bodily through music and art. The three examples referring to the occurrence of prosodic sign in my text will link the development of communication to cultural heritage, which in turn leads us to the existential question of the children with autism or their attachment to the surrounding interaction and different cultural alternatives and possibilities to communicate. The most important thing is to secure the future of culture by taking care of the well-being of all children. A child with a disability is a cultural challenge to society as well as to the people who are responsible for the child's development well, and sorry, life. To, I'm sorry, uh, time, time is running. And oh, still, sorry. And, yes, and, and yes. Sorry. Yeah, yes. So will you just, uh, just conclude? Just thank you. It's excellent. Okay. It's okay? Yes. No. Please. Excellent. Oh, it's, time is over. Sorry. It's for Panu to, to express.
uh, his his presentation, please. Oh, please conclude. Okay. Resonance says that the feeling of that is human voice, instrumental sounds in music wins in the words. The touch of silence with autism, autism at first with resonance, music listening to silence without spoken language or any words. That's the question of my project. And I think the answers will be found possibly in collaboration with Pi and cognitive semiotics. Thank you for your participating. Oh, yes, Th thank you, thank you very much, because you are studying a very important problem, namely this autism. Uh, so why certain people refuse to communicate? It's a very semiotical problem. And if you can bring some new light to this new, new uh, theory, it is certainly valuable. So, but I'm sorry, time is running very fast. And Bianca, okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> asking. Our, our next speaker is Panu, is there, I suppose? Panu? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay. So we are ready to hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. And uh, I'm uh, doing a PhD at the University of Helsinki. And my, I'm, I'm studying Mozart's piano concertos. And my main approach is the existential, existential semiotic theory. Um, since we are dealing with um, instrumental music, and we are studying it with semiotics, the main problem is... Uh, how absolute music can be studied w with tools that relate meaning to, to to the absolute music, which is often said that it is pure musical meaning which cannot be expressed through words. So that's the basic problem. As a means of bringing out the character of human drama, as I say in my title in Mertes Piano Concertos, this paper presents a model that introduces morality into the music analytical description of concerto form. So it's a music analytical study as well. Morality in music is essentially an outcome of representation of the outside world in the processes of a musical work. From a late 80th century perspective, morality is encountered in both actual moral concepts, but also so-called sentiments or passions. A notorious analysis of these concepts is uh, David Hume's uh, The Treatise of Human Nature. Yet a concerto is essentially a dialogical phenomenon by nature, and therefore a set of tools for analysis of interaction between solo and ritornello sections, which means that the soloist and the orchestra um, is based on deontic forces, and I'm introducing this uh, uh, ingredient to the theory, which is basically the Zemic model, which has been already talked about here. The paper presents a model that visualizes and systematizes the relations between sentiments, music and concepts, and these theontic forces. This is carried out through analysis of re respective subsidiary Zemic models that are based on existential semiotics. Uh, my topic in this talk is mainly uh, C major and G major concertos, but the an actual analysis will be very brief because of the, the time restriction. Um, anyway, the idea is how, uh, when the form itself unfolds, how the um, signif signification unfolds at the same time. When it can be seen how types of signs in the cultural sphere are transformed to be represented in the musical work, it can be inferred what the corresponding interdisciplinary approaches or let's say disciplines that are needed in the musicological and music analytical research process. So I will attempt to share my screen now, just a, just a moment. Can you please tell me if you can see anything? Yes, we are about to see it. Yes, existential semantics to the force. Yes, fine. So I will be showing some slides here. Um, so the research presupposes that the primary standpoint from where concert form is examined is that of dialogue. When one starts to look at the human relations and the kind of dialogue it makes arise between individuals, 
and between an individual and society, this interaction forms the elementary unit of examination. Yet it can exist at many levels, inside the work, between parties of representation, and between uh, the work and the outer reality. When it is the question of an individual's relation to the other, there is a multidimensional network of interactions that are deeply intertwined. It is obvious that part of these interactions originate in different fields of knowledge and expertise from different disciplines. But thus, depending on the case in question, the constellation is in addition to being multi-theoretical, as we have heard, it is also an interdisciplinary one. The idea of the internal and the external being connected through Tarasti's CEMIC model and then the three subsidiary models uh, that give overall model additional internal and external consistency. Behind each of the models, which I call Z0, uh, um, is the basic form of the Zemic model. And here we have what, what I call music analytical Zemic model. And Z1, uh, wait a minute. Um, Z1 is the dialogical Zemic model, which is over here. So the tools to analyze the, the dialogue and historical cultural Zemic model would, would be the Z2. Therefore, it is a matter of degree how far the internal and the external are from one another. This idea also explains why one sometimes experiences music as entirely autonomous, something that music analysis customarily takes as a, a disciplinary given. In other words, the three squares are able to move in relation to one another in order to produce different interpretations, not without limits, of course, but in a free manner according to the basic insights of the, of the performer. An extreme case of this would be what Daniel Chua calls Beethoven going blind. So, um, but what one needs to further develop the framework is to delineate the behavior of sentiments with respect to the antique modality and the respective normative structures. This paves the way to understand those mechanisms that are behind the interaction of themes and thematic groups, ultimately behind interaction between soloist and orchestra. This will then lead to the enhanced understanding of the role of benevolence in Mozart's concerto discourse. Well, how do these uh, three or four models then function with respect to each other? Within the Zemic theory, experience has been analyzed into components. Uh, the resulting, let's say, grid integrates them and di dialogizes them into a form suitable for interaction. When synthesized, they bring along the external component that would otherwise be lacking in music analysis. These subsidiary models uh, have Zemic models in them themselves. All this happens inside the work and is thus the result of representation. Extra world functions according to supra or perhaps also to what, what, what Taras calls trans -semic. At this point, relations already have the normative structure. Now, this is a recent figure here, but this could possibly be um, conceptualized as, as the problem of representation that we come from Z2 to Z0, which is the, which is the work. And, and the, these are the um, intermediate phases there. Panu, I think that our time is so, soon running. And we had one, at least one comment by Bianca Suarez Puerta. I think you would like to have something. Yes, I'm, I'm concluding about now. OK, fine. So, um, the norms of an individual transcend those of the social in, in certain cases. For a moment, normativity then ceases to exist. And according to Rousseau, 18th century thinking, this is the moment where an individual re-enters the lost pureness of state of nature again. And to conclude, now one might ask if the above framework is general enough to allow the use of any discipline that might be needed 
to study, for example, emotions with respect to musical performance. Could some other vantage point be, be taken? The model is flexible enough to allow, for example, the inclusion of some other scientific approach that is used in the study of emotions. The list is a long one, but these include, for example, psychology, effective neuroscience, sociology, psychiatry, etc. These could be included if their contribution proved to be useful for research. To sum up, we have come to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of the present framework and the way in which existential semiotics is able to bring out the humane nature of dialogue in Mozart's piano concertos. And I will stop here. Thank you for your attention.